Well, good morning, good evening uh, from Nautilus, wherever you are in this world. Uh, we're really happy to be kicking off uh, our webinar series, Friends of Nautilus, uh, particularly at this time where we're going to talk about innovation in the times of COVID, the challenges shipping businesses are, are facing and how they're tackling those with digitalization. Um, we're honored uh, in this very first installation of this series to have Klaus Nemzow from uh, West, uh, Eastern Pacific Shipping uh, on board. Klaus is a longtime friend uh, of Nautilus. Uh, he's been a true partner for us uh, in the working relationship there. And, and more broadly, as we'll get into today, has a breadth and depth of experience, both inside and outside shipping uh, on how digitalization can change businesses. That is, is really helpful to understand uh, certainly has helped to guide the progress of our partnership uh, with EPS as a client um, and more broadly I think it brings some insight into this unique uh, situation that everyone seems to be facing nowadays particularly as I come to you from my home uh, here in Brooklyn New York uh, still disrupted by uh, the work from home environment and uh, COVID's impact on, on us all really. Um, Klaus at the outset you know I just want to give you a sec to, to introduce yourself and, and share anything you think is relevant with the, with the audience. Sure. Thank you, Matt, for thank you very much for having me. I'm also, as you can see, I'm also joining from my home in Singapore here. It's uh, evening, eight o'clock here. And um, yeah, so I just joined uh, Eastern Pacific in October last year. In fact, Friday this week, it's going to be one year. And uh, as Chief Innovation Officer, I'm also running the IT department. And um, I guess the position was newly created uh, by Gil Ofer, who I believe sort of spearheaded um, bringing EPS into the, the age of innovation. Before I joined, I was in the digital innovation team at um, BP, so oil and gas, which included a little bit of shipping as well, and to some extent sort of similar issues. And before that, I was involved with a couple of startups in Hong Kong. I had a uh, startup called 3D Avatar School, which was um, doing uh, teaching in an immersive gamified environment for kids in China to learn English. And uh, before that, I was involved with uh, companies like Shazam, the music recognition thing, and did a lot of consulting in my, my life in, in different cities, uh, New York, actually, at some point, uh, London, Hong Kong, before I came to Singapore. Thank you so much. Yeah, and that, it's, that, it's that heterogeneous mix of experiences, I think, makes you a great fit for the current role and also, uh, you know, an, an app person to have this dialogue with because uh, you bring a sort of a, a very unique perspective to it. Um, what I would tell the audience is, you know, if you have questions, please direct them to the Q&A area of Zoom down below in your navigation bar, and we'll tackle those questions as we can through the course of this dialogue. Um, and then, of course, uh, if you have colleagues or friends you'd like to share this with, it will be available on demand after uh, the dialogue today. Um, you know, at the outset, I think it's kind of the, the framing of this whole conversation, and it seems to be the dialogue and so many conversations that I have nowadays is, you know, shipping in the time of COVID. Um, you know, obviously there's been a tremendous impact on the crews, seafarers, the markets as well. Um, I'm curious what your perspective is on how COVID has impacted shipping and, and the shipping business that you're a part of. Yeah, so when I joined, I think um, shipping was sort of at the cusp of being ripe for innovation. I mean, the maritime industry shipping has probably been behind other industries like aviation in particular, or even oil and gas for, you know, several years, maybe even for a decade or so. So I think shipping started to look into innovation anyway, into digital things and so forth. Um, but I think this virus thing, COVID-19, um, hasn't changed things fundamentally, but I think it's accelerating things. So for a whole number of reasons, obviously, you know, for economic pressure that, you know, we'll, we'll see more, I think, in the future. Um, but also simply to avoid contact. And, you know, a lot of the shipping processes were paper-based and people coming on board to check paper documents and all this kind of stuff. And of course, it's not necessary. So I think the, the main thing that I see of, of COVID-19 uh, is to accelerate, it's sort of a catalyst to accelerate innovation in shipping. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we see much the same thing in the market where, you know, and, and our own experience is three years ago, uh, it was a very different dialogue around digitalization. You know, it was really only the first movers who were getting engaged in it um, on a programmatic basis, maybe others on more of a testing the waters basis. But now I think so much of that disruption has been driven into people's lives, into the business. You know, companies that have been very used to having everyone in the office collaborating together every day have been, you know, shifted to this environment where you have to rely on digital tools to connect teams and, and connect to global business. Um, 
so I, I totally uh, agree with what you're saying. I, I guess, you know, when you think about it from the ship perspective and that idea of a connected vessel, how, do, how does that impact kind of down to that level of business operations and digitalization? I mean, sort of one of the things we're doing, obviously, with Nautilus is to install high frequency data analysis and sensor connection and so forth. And what we have to do for that is to do some physical installation on vessels. And in the past, you know, we would send a team of people to go wherever the port is, Singapore, other ports, to meet the vessel, go on board and install these things. But now for a whole number of reasons, uh, you know, the main impact actually is on crew exchange. That has become, you know, difficult or impossible. Uh, so we needed to improvise. But good thing is people in shipping, I think, are used to improvise and just being very resourceful. Uh, so to do the deployment part, the installation part, um, a piece of what we're doing is we're trying to combine things. So if we have to install a bunch of different, you know, maybe cybersecurity box, you know, something for, for Nautilus Labs, we're trying to combine some of these tasks into one work package. And then if we can do it with our people, we might do that. But increasingly also, we're either trying to deploy people that are locally, some agencies or some local contractor group that, you know, is already there and can, can operate there. Or increasingly, we're actually trying to use our own people on the, the vessel. So they're becoming sort of the experts in configuring IP things and, you know, doing wiring. I mean, often they have the qualifications already for that. So we're just trying to be resourceful. Uh, but that's one of the, um, has become one of the in, sort of uh, installation bottlenecks, including the basics like a VSAT connectivity. But we're trying to, to find ways around that. Yeah, that's an interesting point. You know, again, kind of our, our experience pre-COVID was, you know, there might be some crewing uh, activity in terms of wiring, uh, maybe running some pipes on board the vessel. Uh, but it really has uh, changed quite a bit in the last year. And we've had, you know, multiple clients we've worked mm -hmm. with where, you know, they've gotten the crew engaged in the actual configuration installation process. I'm curious, you know, what kinds of challenges does that present in terms of effectively onboarding them and training them to, to do those activities? Um, and, and, how, and how have you seen it turn out when, when you do get the crew more actively involved in those activities? Well, I think they all enjoy it. It's always interesting to sort of uh, extend, uh, you know, the, the space of your responsibilities and or apply skills that you already have for, for, for the new task. So it certainly does slow down things a little bit because, you know, it does take longer. But as we're having sort of increasingly connectivity on board, so once we have VSAT and then we can talk to people in real time, we can guide them through the process, you know, we're documenting what they have to do. Um, so it's, you know, it's not a fundamental obstacle. We're finding ways and I think the crew is, uh, is you know, very happy to, to try out new things and to help in any way, which is, you know, makes things more interesting in some ways, particularly because one of the, the main challenges that the whole industry has is that, you know, it's the crew exchange. So normally people would stay only so many months on board and, you know, now they, they have to stay longer. So, so these things, um, you know, that, that works out fine. Yeah, that's certainly that, that, that crisis, you know, uh, you know, the industry wide crisis that is, crew exchange and relief is ongoing. Um, as with so many things in shipping, it doesn't get the attention in uh, the global media that you would hope it would. I mean, it really is a key worker challenge that has been uh, sorrowfully under addressed uh, by the Port Nations that, that could really make it much simpler. So I, I think that's an interesting aspect of, of how, to, how to vary the workflow and make it more interesting. I, I also have a tendency to believe that you know, as innovation continues in ocean shipping, that will be an increasing part of, of the responsibilities of the crew. You know, I, I think we, we generally don't believe that an autonomous unmanned vessel is particularly a near-term thing that will occur in shipping. We think that may happen over the course of a generation, but that um, transition uh, of some of the responsibilities of the crew into focusing on these systems that are on board and uh, ensuring that the a connected vessel is highly efficient and, and operating, we think is a big part of, uh, of that innovation that's going to occur. Um, but I'm really curious here actually from you, you know, what, how do you think um, EPS focuses on innovation? What do you think, what do you think really, if you could distill it down to the where, why, and how of, of, of the focus there um, beyond this type of crewing aspect? I mean, one of the things, you know, using Nautilus Labs platform uh, sort of implicitly means there is much more communication and sharing of the same information between people on, on the vessel and people on shore. 
and then combine that with communication methods, you know, there can be really an interesting discussion about interpretation of, you know, what's going on on the ship, what's going on with an engine, ideas about optimizing voyages and so forth. So I think it really sort of increases the collaboration between people onshore now that they have access to all the data that, you know, that nobody had before really. And the people on the vessel, the master, the engineers, they have actually the same data. So that's kind of a key aspect, I think, of sort of just making collaboration much more, more closely. Another thing on the social side, actually, we're introducing a sort of internal social network that mm -hmm. is a platform that runs on mobile phones that allows those vessels. And I think soon we'll have all of our uh, fleet uh, connected to the internet uh, by a visa that allows people to take part in things that maybe are not work related. So we're doing sort of cooking recipe challenges. Uh, people are taking amazing videos of their journey on ships, you know, on the other side of the earth and they can share that with all of the company, not just the people onshore, but everybody else on, on the other vessels. Um, fitness exercise, for example. So we're installing, you know, uh, gyms in some of the new ships uh, and so sort of, you know, fitness exercise and, and uh, competitions between people on the ships. And so th all of those things, I mean, they're enabled by technology, but they're sort of more of the social and seafarer welfaring, uh, well-being, that's that sort of thing. So that's also important, I think. Facebook, but for the oceans. I can see the pitch to the VCs uh, in, in a year or two for now of the, the globally connected maritime community. It's, 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 it's amazing. I think like one of the things, and I've heard very diverging opinions at senior levels of shipping companies over the course of year, over the years of um, that, that topic of seafarer engagement and, you know, what type of, what type of life work environment you want to create for people in an industry that's already accustomed to work from home, right? I mean, seafarers work from home every day um, in a yep. sense because they live on the vessel and, and they also do their job on the vessel. Um, and so it's, it is really fascinating to see some of the work you guys are doing. I know we've seen on some of some of the new ships that you, you have launched, these amazing facilities for crew. Um, and oh, yeah, they, they look like boutique hotels, so just amazing. The new accommodation on some of the dual fuel uh, LNG ships that just came out of the, the Korean shipyards. They're just in, incredible. And I think those things contribute as well. Everybody has their mobile phone, so people, you know, get free Wi-Fi. But we're also, for example, we're also trying to do the free Wi-Fi in uh, where people are together. So what we, we don't really want to encourage is sort of people, you know, being too much by themselves. So the social interaction between people on the ship as well as between people on the vessel and, and on shore, that's, that's really important as well. I, I totally agree. I think that's, that's one of the first points you made. And, and it's really that idea of how we more closely connect ship and shore to provide better collaboration. And obviously in, in our working relationship, we've seen it on topics like speed optimization and, and generator optimization, where there really can be an effective dialogue about how to make the operations more efficient. I think just developing that human connection and that rapport and that trust and that um, relied upon relationship is, is also a, a big part of it. Um, you know, obviously, you know, EPS is, is pretty far along the path of technology adoption and, and thinking through where the opportunities are for innovation and shipping. So I, I'm curious, how do you, you know, separate out um, the, the, the truth from the fiction, uh, the value from the flash, uh, you know, obviously there's, you know, running jokes that I've heard at conferences of IOT, blockchain, AI to optimize shipping, you know, and it's kind of a, a running joke with, with, some, with some firms. But how do you think about crystallizing where the opportunity is and, and what are the real um, technologies that can support that for innovation? Yeah, as, as sort of a former management consultant and technology consultant, I'm almost physically allergic against sort of too much, you know, BS and hot air and meaningless jargon. So all of these things like IoT, digital transformation, what on earth is, does that even mean? So, you know, there is a lot of hot air um, in this space. Uh, the way sort of, you know, to answer your question, the way we're addressing is we're working very closely with Techstars. So Techstars is this global early stage investor and a company that helps corporations to do innovation. And they and the process really helped us a lot to screen companies to come into the program. So we have this program that, you know, applications go from, I think, April to the end of August. And then September, we make selections. We're just in the middle of finalizing that. And from, from November through February, companies, you know, these startups participate in a very intense program. And this process itself and tech stars, I think, uh, experience and sort of ability to get to really interesting companies. 
that's one way I think to, you know, just this whole screening. So we started looking at literally over a thousand companies and end up with, you know, with 10 companies. So I think that's, that's a key thing. And then, um, yeah, another thing we're looking for is the, the team that is running those things. So people with experience, with credibility, often, as you said earlier, it doesn't necessarily need to all come from the maritime industry. Sometimes it's really beneficial to have people coming from the outside and providing a fresh perspective. But um, yeah, so we're definitely sort of allergic against the, uh, the, 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 the meaningless jargon. Another way to sort of, I guess, screen and, and qualify that is we have... Um, 200 people in Singapore, the headquarters, and sort of 5,000 in total. And all of these guys are, you know, very, very experienced, uh, former masters, captains, engineers. So really, they know the maritime space. And as we're bringing sort of, you know, innovation companies uh, to these guys, they would very quickly also, and they're involved in the selection process itself, actually. So they already help us sort of to spread, you know, the, uh, the, the, the stuff that really has substance and things that might not have as much. That makes that makes perfect sense, and I, you know, I obviously, it should go uh, without saying, but I'll I'll say it uh, because it matters. Is you know, we were we were fortunate enough to participate in the very first uh, cohort there of the accelerator, and for us as a business, it has been absolutely essential uh, to getting our business off the ground um, in the Asia Pacific region. Obviously, we're a business that started here in New York, but our client base is entirely globally distributed. Um, as vessels are entirely globally distributed. And so I think the accelerator experience for us was, was phenomenal. I, I guess, you know, it, it raises an interesting question though, you know, if, if you were, if there's someone in the audience today who is considering um, joining, or if there's someone out there who is thinking about getting started um, in this space and, and would be interested in participating in the accelerator, if you had to boil it down to a single metric, like what, what, is, what is the thing that you would use as the, the guiding light, the North Star for an entrepreneur, if they want to get something off the ground and get involved with uh, an accelerator, particularly of the caliber of, of EPS Techstars? Well, I think if it's a single impact, it's almost like the stereotype, it's impact. I mean, maybe not a moonshot, but something that, that really can address problems that matter. So, you know, fuel consumption, uh, carbon emissions, sustainability, um, health and safety, seafarer, well-being, all those things are, you know, the important topic for us. So any kind of metric that has, you know, a really impact on the, the things that matter for shipping, really, that's, that's the key thing for us. I, I, I think that's right. And I know for us as a business from our earliest days to now as a more mature startup, um, much later in the game, we're, we're about to hit our fourth anniversary mm. here next week, as a matter of fact, um, you know, I think that's always been when what we focused on is impact, you know, when we think about the impact we can have on greenhouse gas emissions, on fuel consumption um, and, and efficiency, the numbers are dramatically large across the industry. And it's always what we've tethered ourselves to, um, specifically because that's the impact that we want to see in the world. Um, and it's also true and helpful that if you're trying to build a business, make sure it's a big problem that you're tackling. I think that's, that's what every startup that is made its name and has done something truly meaningful in the world uh, has done they focused on a, a massive problem um, to solve. I guess, you know, I know I have a perspective on this, but you know, I, I actually be really more curious to hear your perspective is, you know, when you think about what the impact is and how um, the technology can be leveraged from machine learning in data science, um, where, where do you see the greatest value created in your business today and where do you think it will be created over the course of the next few years? Yeah, so for me, machine learning, uh, AI, it's, it's software, right? So I think software is, is the, the stuff that is more powerful than hardware. So one of the things in, um, in the AI and machine learning space is computer vision. And for me, it's just an example of using pretty much standard hardware. I mean, it's the same way that you have a Tesla car and then you just upgrade the software or, you know, even iPhone, other things. So the hardware might be the same. It might not be something special even, but it's the software, it's the machine learning behind that that makes it powerful. So things like computer vision <coughs> um, are really interesting because they're purely sort of enabled by machine learning. And um, the, the, the applications could range from health and safety uh, to making things more efficient to, you know, one of the startups that we had in the previous uh, cohort is using just a mobile phone and computer vision to recognize objects and then do automated inventory management. So the key thing with, with AI and machine learning is it's, you know, it's such a broad application. 
But the, the challenge for that is um, to, in order to train your models, you need to have relevant data. And that's kind of a thing that is not that easy in shipping. So, you know, video analytics through machine learning, well, not many people have lots of video footage because, you know, maybe nobody has recorded it. Cameras are just used for, you know, navigational help in real time. So there, I think for the machine learning, the, the critical ingredients in many cases is, is data availability. And that's been an obstacle, but it's also the opportunity. So I think sort of, you know, that's probably one of the key areas um, <clears throat> that enables other things as well. So robotics is another interesting thing. So robots and shipping have been, you know, and subsea have been these gigantic sort of working class, you know, oceaneering and other companies. Now what you see is a lot of creativity trying to make robots, be it so things that swim or flying, you know, drone kind of things to make them more intelligent and more autonomous. And of course, cheaper and lighter and smaller and that kind of thing. So that's kind of another thing. A lot of things, of course, are enabled again by AI, autonomous robotics and by sensor fusion and so forth. But those things, that's another sector, I think where we'll see, you know, much more sort of being surrounded and helped by autonomous robots, be they flying, crawling or swimming. I think that's another interesting area of innovation for us. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I, when I think about our own business, you know, the it's always interesting sort of the application of the technology versus, uh, you know, actually generating the return on the technology. And obviously, in some of those areas like computer vision and robotics, I think the, the life cycle is very long um, to get there because of some of those, you know, technical barriers uh, to entry for the actual product itself. I, I'm curious, you know, when you think about um, data science, machine learning as it pl uh, applies to defining data-driven insights and taking action and implementing that type of technology inside of a business, what do you, what do you think are some of the, the other hurdles more intrinsic to business transformation and organizational change um, that require program management uh, to, to actually get the value out of a new technology? And that's a very interesting question. So in oil and gas, so the previous sector that I was active in, you have, you know, the oil majors and other big players. They have, you know, 70,000 people and they have, you know, pretty sizable data science departments. In fact, they might have their own supercomputer. So they have really sort of pretty powerful in-house capabilities for data science, hardware, software-wise. But why? Because they need it for exploration. They have sort of masters of data, but they're also very big players. Or well, banks is probably the same thing, financial services. Yeah, the shipping industry is very fragmented. So EPS with, you know, we're one of the larger players in the industry and we're not, you know, as big as, you know, big banks or other kinds of things. So I think the statistics, if I remember right, 80% of shipping companies have five or 10 or fewer ships. That means that none of those companies has the kind of big data science department that can do analytics themselves. And that will not really change overnight. So the, you know, yet the, the problems and the need of course is there, you know, supply chain, uh, optimization, a lot of optimization problems. Uh, so the only way in the short term, at least, to make that that sort of uh, possible for a shipping company is to go through startups, through companies that have the, the knowledge, the capabilities in-house, they can sort of prepare that for us and then we can use it. Satellite is another interesting example. So you have these swarms of constellations of nanosatellites in low orbit that, you know, getting increasingly more powerful you know, a big oil major, they might get the raw data, or say from radar satellites, they might get the raw data and do the analytics themselves. There's no way that, you know, a shipping company, unless maybe very few, uh, has that capability in-house. So the only way for us in the industry to get benefit from this is if there's this intermediate layer of early stage startup companies that have the capabilities, they can prepare this value added application layer that then people like us can use. That's, I think, the only way sort of to make this really sophisticated algorithmic stuff work for an industry like ours. And then if, if you were going to give advice to that startup, right, you know, that has that value added um, software that can deliver return for the business, when they think about partnering with an organization that does have that, those level of capabilities that you described, like an EPS, are there any, are there any key principles that you would give them in terms of how to structure that relationship to, to actually ensure that adoption occurs and the, and the, the, the advantage is realized? Yes, yeah, so I think that's what would probably not be the best way to do is, as again, you find in another industry that works if you have sort of, you know, a million dollar consulting project 
and you know sort of big upfront things you know a lot of upfront investment i think people in the shipping industry they would be willing to pay sort of a month by month so this whole idea of you know software as a service subscription you know cloud based kind of stuff i think that's the only way to make it work because people are willing to you know combine that with you know a freemium model so if you can try something out for a while it delivers value and then you can pay sort of on a monthly basis that is probably the better way to make that work just from a business model perspective then of course the other really important thing is that companies working they have to sort of put themselves into our shoes and understand you know maybe read a book or two or talk to some people you know how the shipping industry thinks and works because a lot of those you know things are very different by fleet type you know container ships versus oil tankers uh, so you know the customer relationship the business model even the contractual things are all very different it's not rocket science to understand but i think people need to understand that a little bit and then they can construct products and services that really cater that need and develop that sort of uh, de deliver that as a software as a service i think that's probably the way to make it work that makes that makes sense and, and do, do you, you know when you think about as a this is probably more advice for other chief innovation officers cios inside of shipping companies are there any initiatives that that you're specifically driving that will help to enable end users inside the business to take advantage of different technologies as as you identify the ones that work and look to have them proliferate across the business? Well, one of the things we're doing, and that was actually planned before COVID, is virtual reality for training. So we have challenges, for example, we're, we're creating, we're building these new ships with dual fuel technologies. LNG is a much cleaner uh, sort of uh, bunker fuel. And uh, that technology is quite complex and a lot of people don't have, you know, the, the experience. So in the past, people were sent to academies somewhere in Korea or in Denmark or so, and that, you know, costs a lot of money. It takes time away. And worse than that, people sort of learn as they go there for five days and then they forget, forget, forget uh, quickly. So using something like, you know, a virtual reality, uh, particular for this type of industrial training where you're in a space, uh, from wherever you are, that might be your home country, it might be, it doesn't really matter, instructors would be in the same virtual space and you have a shared experience. There might be, you know, five, eight students and an instructor from anywhere in the world and they can see each other as avatars, they can hear each other and then they can practice, you know, the physical tasks of what you do on a ship. You have to, you know, move the pump around, you have to connect hoses, you have to do switches, you know, lots of stuff that you know, really requires muscle memory. So it's really not that great if you just read about it on a PDF, then you need to do it, you know, literally with your hands. And some of these virtual reality technologies like an you know, Oculus Quest or so, you know, now it's not that expensive anymore. And that's stuff that, you know, we're building sort of these virtual reality training environments and the early feedback is, is really positive. And now with COVID, of course, that's, you know, not even a nice to have, that's almost a must because you can't send people to Denmark or to Korea and it changes all the time. And that allows you also then once you have these capabilities in place to do things differently. Now you don't need to deliver training as a five day block, which was the only way that you could do it in sort of a real environment. Now you can deliver it in pieces, which means that you could have refreshers. So we could do things very differently. So virtual reality is, is something that uh, we're, we're pushing quite a bit and it's, it's, I think it's going to be really successful. Well, it, it's a good, it's a good place for us to, to drive to the final question here, since you've answered uh, all the tough ones quite well uh, so far. If you were to keep your AI enabled VR glasses on for a moment and to look out at 50 years in the future, you know, as a, as a CIO, as a chief innovation officer, one of the things that I'm sure is on your mind a lot is where is the industry going? What's going to be important for my business over the next, not just 12 months, but the next 12 years, the next 20 years, the next 50 years? What do you see? What do you think are the big ways the industry is going to change? And where, you know, if we were having this conversation uh, many decades in the future, where do you think shipping will actually be and what will it look like um, at that point in time? I mean, that's hard because it's hard to say what's going to be next week uh, or next month or so. 50 years is a long time. But I mean, some of the trends that I see is certainly uh, different types of fuel uh, because, you know, sustainability issues that's continuing to be, you know, a huge topic for, for the industry. You know, there's some short term solutions like LNG. So I think, you know, we'll look at, you know, what could be sort of long term ways to optimize that. And I think the connectivity is going to be in places like, you know, we're talking about virtual reality now for training. You could have an environment where you have a digital twin of a ship and you could step into this as an avatar 
and I could see all, you know, the Nautilus, you know, information that today I get on a screen. I could be in this virtual space and I could literally sort of see the information, real time sensors embedded into this. And then I could have people from different uh, locations solving problems in this digital twin um, in a way that's much more intuitive, I think. So, you know, this whole connectivity using VR and, and augmented reality, I think is, is an interesting one. Um, another sort of more fundamental business thing is supply chains. So currently each player in the supply chain like just looks at their little piece. So our job is to bring something from port A to port B. And we're, you know, even the stuff that we're doing together, that's just to optimize that bit. It might, if you look more holistically supply chain end to end, maybe there's no point in trying to rush to this harbor using all the sophisticated technology because maybe it's okay if it comes you know, two days later, the warehouse isn't ready or the end consumer doesn't want it yet. So if you could do end-to-end -end supply chain, and it sounds kind of obvious and I think it is, but technically that's, you know, in business model wise, that is just very challenging. So <laughs> it might actually take 50 years until, you know, we pull that off, though it shouldn't really be, be rocket science. Those are, I think some, I and mean, then of course there's sort of this potential autonomous, um, not just autonomous shipping, but autonomy in general. And that's, you know, hard to say when and to what extent that will come. Uh, but you might see sort of uh, some more autonomous, you know, stuff in docking operations. So, you know, some of the, the bits and pieces that are currently done very manual. I think that there's potential for making those things more automated, more autonomous and, and safer at the same time. Yeah, I would agree on that last point where it starts nearer to shore and in easier to solve challenges and then expands out over over the course of time. But really, really what I would say, Klaus, is, you know, we aspire for the same future. We think all of these topics tie together and, and it actually paves the pathway for that carbon free future uh, for shipping to be a leader in the carbon free space. Uh, it starts with connectivity. It starts with data. It starts with leveraging technology. Um, exploring things like alternative fuels. And that's, that's how we're going to get there ultimately. Um, but, but really exciting to understand your vision. I think we uh, successfully touched on uh, the questions that came up in, in Q&A through the course of this conversation. And just want to thank you for your time, remind everyone that this session will be available on demand if you want to share it. And we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thanks very much. It was a big pleasure. Let's continue this dialogue. Thank you, Klaus. Cheers.